Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the humbling privilege to speak with Tom Volk, professor of biology at the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. Specializing in mycology and forest pathology, Tom teaches courses on mycology, medical mycology, plant and microbe interactions, food and industrial mycology, advanced mycology, organismal biology, and Latin and Greek for scientists. His website, Tom Volk's Fungi, has a popular Fungus of the Month feature and an extensive introduction to kingdom fungi. Besides dabbling in mushroom cultivation, Tom has worked intimately with the genera Morkella, Cantharellus, Hydnellum, Armillaria, and Latoporus, a lineup of edible varieties that will make every forager's mouth water. He has also embarked on several medical mycology projects, investigations into prairie mycorrhizae, mycoprospecting, and fungi that are involved in coal formation. He has also conducted fungal biodiversity studies in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Alaska, and Israel. Having lectured in 35 states so far, Tom is a popular speaker at amateur and professional mycological events throughout North America, including NAMA and NEMF forays. Not the least of his accolades, Tom was named president of the Mycology Society of America in 2017. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for making me sound good. Well, I have to credit the folks who wrote your bio for the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> so there's a lot of Thanks. exciting things we could talk about. Obviously, I think your knowledge spans a lot of different areas of mycology, as we could tell from me rattling off the courses you teach. And I am excited to get into the topic that you recommended, which was secondary metabolites and fungi. I'm really excited to learn more about that. It's something that as a layman, I didn't have a great understanding of. But before we dive into it, uh, as much as you can, because I know this is often a chain of synchronicities and vast numbers of life events that lead to this, but let us know how mushrooms took over your life. You know, was it strictly academic? Was it something in the family and interest sparked as a teenager? You know, how do mushrooms take over your life? Well, I took a course at Ohio University where I was undergrad in 1978 in mycology, and I found out you could get free food. <laughs> so I was hooked after that. So, you know, some people, their you know, their families go mushroom hunting and everything like that. But my that was not in my bloodstream and in my genetics at all uh but it got in there when it came time to go to grad school i decided to go to university of wisconsin in madison to study fungi more and worked there for a while to get my phd did a postdoc in forest products lab in madison and i've been in lacrosse since 1996. so you came for the free food and left with an appreciation of fungi that turned out to be a, a life path for you. Right. So lots of people, you know, amateur mushroomers get into it because of their, um, you know, they could find it, they could get really delicious food. And, you know, some of them turn on to the other aspects of it as well. And so I'm happy for that, uh, you know, for everyone. Gourmet mushrooms. That was what drew me into it. So I'm not surprised to hear food was a main driver for you. <laughs> Now, something that I've become increasingly interested in, and I see it's something that you specialize in, is this idea of forest pathology. I know this is a huge topic, but briefly, what is forest pathology and why is it so relevant to have an understanding of kind of these greater forest-wide and ecological-wide relationships when we're talking about fungi? You can think of it more as forest ecology. And so, and pathology is a part of that. So looking at the way that fungi interact with all of the, the trees, the plants, the animals, um, insects, they're a very big part of the forest. But sometimes you see the manifestation of that, you know, as a, a mushroom growing above the ground on a piece of wood or even being a pathogen of a tree. But they're really supplying the nutrients for the plant underground as mycorrhizae. And so there's a huge amount of fungal biomass underground providing the absorption of minerals for the plants. And so 
probably the mycorrhizae were very important in moving onto land for the plants to be able to move onto land. You know, there's this intimate association. We know the plants share mycorrhizae. There have been studies showing the movement of radioactive materials between them. If you know, if you add radioactive carbon dioxide to one tree, it'll show up as sugar in another tree. Via this mycorrhizal uh, conduit. Right. So the pathogens are sometimes killing trees, and sometimes that's good because it opens up a gap in the forest and that allows the younger trees to grow. Even aged forest is not, an, not what you would call old growth. Uh, old growth forest has all these different ages of trees. Some of them have died from pathogens and some have died from you know, other causes, lightning, whatever. You know, there's a lot going on, especially underground. I've been studying mycology for 40 years and I think I know now, only now, what's going on underground. <laughs> but I don't know it well enough to tell anybody. Right. So it's in my head and it's all in there connected. I mean, you've got the mycorrhizae, you've got the, the bacteria that live with the mycorrhizae. You have the, the animals, the little insects and nematodes and whoever else is in there. Other kinds of organisms that are relating in that things that are parasitic on everything else. And there's a lot going on underground. And my friend who's an artist has offered to help me make a 3D model of it. So that might be a project in the, in the future to be able to see what's going on underground. It's a lot. It's very, very complicated. That would be an incredibly detailed 3D model. <laughs> yeah. And that is something that I can't help but realize as I get more into studying fungi, you know, beyond just foraging, gourmet, <laughs> medicinal mushrooms, the things I got into. When you really start studying those other aspects of fungi and their role in the greater ecosystem, you can't ignore how central they are to almost every process. And I always think of mushrooms and especially, obviously, mycelium as symbolizing connection. And when you look at something like forest ecology, they're the connectors in so many ways right. between organisms. And I think one of yeah. the big things at play there in how they interact with the environment, how they connect, even how they are able, you know, you think of that process of homing where different hyphal tips are able to find each other to build more biomass. You know, you think of some of these things and a lot of that is driven, a lot of their ability to communicate and connect and do the things we're talking about is driven by uh, chemical processes. Right. And using chemistry to find one another and their genetics and the proteins they produce are making the fruiting bodies. It is, like you were saying, ineffable to think about all these relationships and how they intertwine with everything. But then when you start looking at that side of it in the chemical compounds they produce and how that enables some of these behaviors. For me, it helps me ground a little bit of how this is working, how this organism operates, uh, even though it is something that's hard for us to verbalize or hard for us to cope with without assigning, you know, really anthropomorphic traits to these things. Right. Uh, so when we're talking about these chemicals, we end up talking a, a lot of times about metabolites. Now, obviously, I'll be leaning on you for much of this conversation because this is a new, a new universe to me, and I was really happy when you brought this topic up. So to summarize another huge topic, what are <laughs> metabolites and why are they relevant? Obviously, many organisms have metabolites, but as general as we can be, what are metabolites and why are they relevant? With fungi, we talk about primary metabolism and secondary metabolism for the most part. So primary metabolism means they take their food and they digest it. Uh, they make ATP out of it and they uh, use that energy for cellular processes. So that's primary metabolism. And of course, they can't use everything they get. They don't have the enzymes for it. So there are waste products. Uh, and the waste products are often involved in what we call secondary metabolism. So this happens when the primary metabolism is done or in their you know, in a, in a particular area of a fungus, and they're producing chemicals from that. We used to think that they were just waste products, and the fungi were just producing these things. But now we're finding that many of these secondary metabolites help the fungus to survive. 
The most famous secondary metabolite is penicillin. Penicillin is uh, produced to fight off bacteria. So the bacteria are the main competition for the fungus in the piece of wood or wherever it's growing. And they're producing the penicillin to kill off their competitors. From our perspective, that is an antibiotic because it's killing something other than us. But there are other fungi that produce chemicals that are harmful to us. So we generally call those mycotoxins. All of the mycotoxins are secondary metabolites, but not all the secondary metabolites are mycotoxins from our perspective. And it's interesting, and we can get more into this to understand that why of why these things are produced, because obviously the mushrooms are. Well, there is no there is no why benefit. in evolution. There's things that give an advantage, and things that are neutral, and things that don't. You know, the things that are harmful. You know, evolution doesn't select for, it doesn't select against things that are neutral. So if you have something neutral in there. It may persist, even though evolution hasn't selected for it. It just hasn't selected against it. Right. So if that variation popped up and it wasn't using too much energy from the organism, presenting a disadvantage, then it would just persist as a, as a it byproduct. May persist, yes. So as far as I understand, primary metabolism, that initial process we were talking about, is mostly for the mushroom to process energy, nutrition, basically the, what the mushroom's eating to anthropomorphize it, what the mushroom's eating and right. process it for things that help with growth. Right, exactly. So to grow the mycelium through the, through the soil or the wood and, or to make them, you know, occasionally make a mushroom if they feel like it. Are any of the primary metabolites created in fungi relevant to humans? Are they responsible for any of the compounds that we associate with mushrooms, medicinal or otherwise? Well, I mean, we have the, and we use them as food and those are all the products of the primary metabolism. It's making their cytoplasm, it's making their cell walls, it's making whatever else it has. And, you know, that's primary metabolism that's responsible for that. And when we move into secondary metabolism, we get into some of these more interesting compounds and some of the more unique uses that we think of when we think of fungi when it comes to antibiotics, when it comes to even, I was surprised to see, even psychedelic and theogenic substances within the mushroom are a product of secondary metabolism. Yes. And so, you know, it's all relative to what we're thinking of, what the use for it is. So, you know, we can think about it in kind of different categories. And, you know, some of those, you know, psilocybin and such are secondary metabolites. What they're doing in nature, it's not sure. It may be rarely see the psilocybe that's infected with a insect. So maybe it's anti-insect. That was the heart of my next question. If antibiotic properties may have helped the mycelium fight those microscopic battles with other competitors. I wonder if psilocybin had some similar evolutionary benefit. Uh, yeah. When you talk about preventing insects or, or something else. Yeah. I don't know the details of, you know, of that particular case, but yeah, you know, that's certainly the case in a lot of other things. But if you think of some, some other secondary metabolites, like in the death angel, for example, mm -hmm. Ammonite species, those toxins are being produced and they are not right away harmful to the insects. So, usually, if, you know, if, if a compound is going to be deterrent to insects or other animals, it would taste bad. And so, right. the insect would eat the mushroom and say, Oh, I don't like this, and I'm going to go eat something else. And they leave the mushrooms alone. But for ammonitans that are in in this fungus, the animal eats it, and then maybe three days later it dies. So it's really hard to think about what's the selective advantage for that fungus if the animal that eats it is going to die, and it's not right. going to do anything about not eating other mushroom, not eating the mushroom again. Right, and so it may be one of those examples where it's just a natural byproduct of evolution a vestige that's stuck around because it's not selected against. That's possible. You know, I have friends who are working on that sort of thing and they have, we argue about it all the time, but I, I don't know. Is there a lot of research right now going into evolutionary benefits or evolutionary origins of some of these secondary metabolic processes, you know, Absolutely. aside from randomness? Absolutely. There are, 
lots of people working on that sort of thing. For example, we have the alpha ammonite and that we have in the ammonite device where Jira and such, death angels, is also found in some unrelated fungi like Gallerina and such. It's hard to imagine where that came from evolutionarily. Some people have suggested um, horizontal gene transfer, so a transfer between species some way, but and people are working on that, and I don't know what's, what the state of that research is. When we're on that topic of mycotoxins, there is something very relevant, and this might be a tough one for me to hear because I love <laughs> organic food, and I'm all about organic food. It's what I select for. I think I'm doing a good deed by picking it out at the grocery store. But how do the mycotoxins, another one of these secondary, again, huge category of these secondary metabolites, how do those relate to organic versus non-organic food? Good question. So let's use the most famous mycotoxin as an example, and that's aflatoxin. So aflatoxin is produced by a mold called Aspergillus flavus, AFLA, which is where the name comes from. This thing is produced by fungus growing on grains, either grains that are on the, still on the plant or grains, especially grains in storage. And so it grows very well, produces a secondary metabolite called aflatoxin. Aflatoxin was discovered in 1961 when 100,000 turkeys died in England. And nobody knew what was causing it. They called it turkey X disease uh, and eventually found that it was contaminated peanut meal that they were feeding them. And so they all had problems with their liver and huge doses they were getting it, they died right away. Later, it was found that aflatoxin causes cancer at one part per billion. That's not very high so concentration that's at one all. Of, that's, one of, that's one of the most toxic chemicals that are known. It's all natural. I mean, the only thing that's really much more toxic than it is the botulism toxin, which is uh, orders of magnitude more toxic. Wow. And so aflatoxin finds its way into the food supply, and it is especially common in peanuts because peanuts, of course, grow down underground, and this is a soil organism. Right. And the peanuts can get very easily contaminated. And so you might have encountered this. You're sitting in a bar or somewhere and you're shelling peanuts and you're not paying attention, throwing the shells on the floor, uh, putting the peanut in your mouth and you get something really bitter. Yeah. Spit it out. That's aflatoxin. Oh, great. I've had my exposure yeah. then. So if you're eating individual peanuts, you can figure that out. But if you're making peanut butter, we're actually not going to expect expect every peanut to find out if it's contaminated. So if, the, if it's carcinogenic at one part per billion, what do you think the FDA approved level for aflatoxin peanut butter is? I would imagine below one part per billion. I would imagine it's 20 parts per billion. Really? Yes. But how is that? Po that, was okay. the, that was the smallest level that could be, be measured at the time the regulations were made. So it's still potentially letting through a, a cancer-causing dose. Yes. So the, my, my friends who work on aflatoxin and peanuts, and they say that the name brand companies are safe. The fatal flaw of aflatoxin is if you shine a UV light at it, it glows green. And so each peanut goes down an assembly line and the light shines on and if it shines back, it kicks out. I don't know what they do with those peanuts, but my friends say the name brands of peanut butter are safe. And so one of the problems is that if you are not putting any fungicide on your peanuts, the, you have much more likelihood of having contaminated peanuts. There have been cases where they found several thousand parts per billion of aflatoxin in organic peanut butter. Oh, I told you, Tom, I wasn't going to like to hear this because I love <laughs> organic peanut butter. Yeah, so you, you've got to trust your company to that they have looked at every peanut. For some reason, Canadian peanut butter doesn't have it. The fungus doesn't grow very well in Canada. So Interesting. And I wonder if there are any organic methods or natural methods of deterring aspergillus from growing and thereby creating this uh, metabolite. But I guess if there aren't any natural fungicide, as it were, then the only way to tell would be that organic company shining a UV light on every single peanut. Now, how well known is this? Because I have never in the whole organic versus conventional 
produce debate. And as someone who's gotten into industrial food and mycology and all the relationships there, you're the perfect person to talk to about this. Is this something that's well known by organic producers or just food producers in general, the potential presence of mycotoxins? So I have only rarely heard uh, organic food proponents talk about mycotoxins. Yeah. So there are, besides aflatoxin, there's 500 or 1,000 more, more mycotoxins. There's ones that are produced by a fungus called Fusarium that are pretty common. These are, you know, one of them may be the cause of Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, man. Okay. You know, these are natural compounds, but they're certainly not safe. There's things like something called vomitoxin, which you can imagine what the side effect of that is. T2 toxin, there are the, the stature toxins that are supposedly found in the black mold that people burn their houses down for. Right, right. Uh, but I have not heard organic food proponents talk about mycotoxins and what they're doing to food density. And what makes this such an insidious problem is the fungi that you're talking about producing these metabolites are not large fruiting bodies. I mean, even yeah. in the case of black mold, it's still pretty hard to tell unless you have a really bad case of it that it's even present. Yeah, there's these are all molds that are producing uh, the mycotoxins. So the aspergillus, penicillium, fusarium are the big three. And has there been any research on any ways of filtering? Because I know a lot of people have dealt with mold toxicity, like you're saying, from their house, or they have mold growing on the walls or in the framework of the walls. Has there been any research done on ability for the human body or any substance that can help the human body filter out these metabolites? Aflatoxin, which is the worst of them, yeah, you can autoclave it for as many days as you want at any high temperature you want, and it's stable. Oh my gosh. Okay. So your body can't filter it out. In fact, the, the problem is that the body tries to filter it out but it acts as like an epoxide glue, and that actually binds the DNA and the liver cells together, and then they can't reproduce anymore. So they mistranslate proteins and they become tumor cells. Wow, now this would seem to me to be one of the biggest health issues that we face. And I know it is increasing in <laughs> awareness, but it would seem like this is one of the biggest things we need to be talking about, especially when it comes to food, if there's no way to filter it out and there's no way, then, you know, how are we going to deal with this thing? It's a big deal. And especially in like East Africa, mm -hmm. where people are dependent on a lot of peanuts. And one of my former students who works for the CDC, looking at blood levels of aflatoxin in populations in Kenya and other places in East Africa. And it's there. They're reasonably high levels and the incidence of liver cancer is pretty high. So, you know, there's got to be more education, more use of probably, you know, I'm not a big fan of fungicides either, but if you can prevent that in people, that's the trade-off. Fungicides are way less toxic than aflatoxin. The trade-off that the fungicides are less carcinogenic than this one part per billion epoxy metabolite that gets stuck in your system and can never get flushed out. Now, has that aspergillus species or any of these other mold species also been found on other grains aside from peanuts? Yeah, there is, you know, any grain you can think of. There was actually a national emergency in Hungary one year because their paprika was infected. And paprika. they could have their national just their chicken paprikash. Yeah. And but that was national emergency in, in Hungary. I was hoping you'd say no, it's just peanuts, and then I can steer clear from oh. peanuts. In dry years it can grow on the corn. And then the cattle eat the corn and it's been found in milk. And is there any visible evidence? I know you referenced, you know, popping the peanut in your mouth and it's bitter, but is there visible evidence of this mold that would give you an idea if there is a potentially carcinogenic dose or could that one part per billion come from, you know, a microscopic piece of mold that you can't even see? When you're, you're feeding it to the cattle, you're not going to look at every grain. So yeah. Okay. And the cattle aren't looking at it and they're eating what they get. So practically, there's no visual tool necessarily. I guess, can food companies even really test for this? And can we as consumers, anything we can do is outside of a doctor's office, let's say, that could show any presence of these metabolites in our system? Probably not. I can't think of a way that would do that. You might have symptoms, 
uh, fusarium that that may be related to Lou Gehrig's disease is you know you would get some kind of symptoms that are obvious, but to in a mild case you probably wouldn't see anything. Well, I was fishing for some reassuring answers, and it sounds there like we don't have any. Answers. <laughs> some of these toxins are heat label, so they can they can be broken down. For example, in order to make Cheetos, they heat it at 200 degrees C, and that gets rid of all the fumonacin in the grain. So Cheetos are actually safe from mycotoxins. This is the way they're made. I mean, they're not, maybe not the best thing for you, but they're safe. Well, this does open up a whole new dimension <laughs> of food safety. Let's talk about another thing too. So the grains get contaminated while they're either in storage or sometimes right on the, like a corn cob, corn can get infected. Right. And that's because of the worms that get in there. And the worms carry the, the fungus with them accidentally. And so one way of preventing that is to use BT toxin from, a, which is, comes from a bacterium and that kills the the worms that are coming in there and that gets rid of the toxin. Now we can put the BT toxin in the corn in its genetics and make a genetically modified corn. So here's another trade-off. Are you gonna worry about the genetically modified corn with the BT toxin that's never been shown to have any problem with people or do you worry about mycotoxin that's potentially produced in there by the worm bringing it in. Is the worm that primary vector for infection? I mean, can the fungi just attach to this grain and feed, or is it mostly these worms that are that are causing it to inoculate the grain? It's stuck on the on the worms when they come in. Okay. The fungus is really common. Right. So it, there is some potentiality there to stop that vector if there's some way of dealing with the worm. And again, me championing the side of the organic side of thinking here, if there's some natural way to stop those worms from getting in, maybe that's another vector we could look at. We have this, you know, this natural thing, the Bacillus thuringiensis, the BT toxin is totally natural. Right. So what is natural? That's a good question. That's a good question. And, you know, again, this challenges my worldview in a way that I think is really healthy because you're making me think about things in a whole different light. They're not everywhere. I mean, you, you're still having, you know, most of your crop is probably not going to be infected unless, you know, there's a big inoculum, but it's likely to be there. Now, could this same UV methodology you're talking about with peanuts, could you use that on other grains and that would be a viable way to select out no, parts of the it, harvest? For aflatoxin, yes, you could do that. Right. But I don't think that's very practical to look at every corn grain that comes through. Farmers can find, you know, patches of this in their silos. I mean, there's there's a whole group of fungi and, and bacteria that grow in silos. You know, that's sort of part of breaking it down. Being able to recognize it is, is more difficult. Aside from aflatoxin, does the FDA deal with this issue of mold or mycotoxins in food, maybe in a more responsible way, not to say they're irresponsible, but to have a limit that's allowable, that's over the carcinogenic dose, doesn't seem ideal. So just to restore a little faith in the FDA, I guess, do they have relevant standards for some of these other 500 to 1,000 mycotoxins you're talking about that may be in our food supply? I believe so. I haven't studied that very much, but okay. I believe that there are limits for the other kinds of mycotoxins that are there. Well, and when you think about grains, it's used in every processed food you yeah. can imagine. So this is really something that affects the whole, I mean, you're highlighting an issue that affects our whole food supply chain, everyone's food they have in their kitchen. This is a potential health risk. And as I said, my former student at the CDC is in a whole lab that's working on aflatoxin. And so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work being done. The USDA has several units that have been working on aflatoxin for years and years, 30 years or more. But it's just difficult. They've made some headway, but nothing you know, spectacular. Do these same fungi show up on other substances? Is their relationship strictly with grains? I mean, is this strictly a risk 
that comes from food or you know what other risk is posed to us by uh, mycotoxins in our immediate environment? There's, of course, spores in the air, but those aren't going to necessarily cause any problem. You know, there's the controversy about the black mold having mycotoxin on the surface of it, but no one has proven that people can get sick from from these black molds. Would those spores even have this secondary metabolite in them? Those particular ones do, yeah. Is there anything else we need to know about mycotoxins, any other way that we could potentially defend ourselves? Obviously, we talked about in the food source, it's a bit impractical, and maybe it's going to cause some of us to look at the idea of GMO or pesticides in a little bit different light. But for some of these other potential environmental exposures, like spores that contain the metabolites or potential surface contact, is there any advice or any recommendations you can make for limiting our, our mycotoxin exposure? Um, don't eat moldy food. You know, there are foods that are made from molds. You know, we have tempeh, for example, you know, made from fermented soybeans, and but that doesn't produce any, any mycotoxins. That's a great um, point, though. As we move into, as someone who's vegan myself, as we move into this era where a lot more synthetic foods are being made from yeasts, molds specifically, corn, Q-U-O-R-N. I was going to say that next. So corn is made from a fusarium. Well, that's one of our problem fungi. Yes, it is. Um, I lecture about this in my class, but I won't give you the gory details of it. There are mycotoxins produced by the corn strain, but under the conditions that they grow it, uh, which is a giant loop fermenter, 10 meters tall, they monitor six times an hour for mycotoxins and say that they're, they do not find them under their conditions. I wish they would have used something like agaricus or morel mycelium, uh, <laughs> something generally regarded as safe, GRAS, instead of this fusarium that they found in the backyard of their company. Right. I mean, it does make you question the use of these things. I, I appreciate that they check for it, but it feels like you're playing with fire with this fungus that's known to produce this toxic secondary metabolite to make that the sole food source that you're using. An interesting decision. I've eaten it. It's like a lot of the processed organic foods. It's really salty. I mean, that's the main problem I have with, with all those meat substitutes and things you can buy that they're, they're just too salty. This brings up another interesting question, kind of shifting away from mycotoxins that are going to give me nightmares here. But I think it's really relevant. I think it's really important for people to know this stuff uh, when they're making decisions on something as important as food for themselves and their family. But you brought up that interesting idea of using morel mycelium to create a meat substitute. Mm -hmm. And I know you've done a lot of research into some of our favorite edible mushrooms as foragers. Do you see a future of using mycelium for some of these mushrooms that we may not be able to get to fruit uh, in a controlled setting, but do you see the use of the actual mycelium as a food source on the horizon? Um, I don't see why not. I mean, we're using yeast already, right? So that's, you know, just one little step away. There's actually a patent on growing morel mycelium in that culture from like the 1960s. But we're not treading new ground here. When I was doing my thesis on morels, I tried growing some in liquid culture. And then I tried to eat it. And it tasted good, you know, not really, it had a very faint morale flavor. It also felt like I had hair in my mouth because oh. of the mycelium that I was eating. Now, what was your thesis work looking at? Obviously, did my internet search to find all the materials I could about you. And you've done extensive, extensive work about morels. So can you give us a little insight into this enigmatic fungi it's not clear if it's mycorrhizal it's not clear you know what what this is give us some insight into the the morel mushroom for my thesis i worked on the life cycle of morel so i i couldn't get fruiting bodies to form but i approached it from both directions backwards and forwards you know a lot was going on with the inside the cells and uh, what the nuclei were doing and how they seem to be progressing they form sclerotia which are really hard structures that kind of feel like walnuts because they're really fatty as a food storage thing for overwintering. And that's why they can come up so early in the spring because they've got all the stored food already. 
when I started in lacrosse, my first grad student, Marsha Harbin, started working on uh, Morel mycorrhizae. And so we were able to synthesize mycorrhizae of morels in the lab on elm, which is where we normally find them in the Midwest, and on spruce. You know, we showed in several different ways that it's mycorrhizal physical ways. Uh, we showed that the elms grow better with mycorrhizae, and we traced the a dye across the, the mycelium into the plant. Could morels be one of those types of fungi that have the ability to adapt to multiple food sources oh, if need be? Yes. So, you know, our hypothesis was that the, the morels are mycorrhizal with the elm and they get plenty of food, but when the elm dies, they've lost their food source. So right. they have to make a fruiting body to go somewhere else. Or they'll end up somewhere else. Um, I've grown them on, I literally tried 50 or 60 different kinds of media in the lab and they grew on everything. Wow, so they have this adaptability and flexibility. Yeah, so they seem to be able to grow. You know, whether there's something there that's giving it enough food is is just in the soil. Right. If it's I don't know if they what they could adapt to there, but certainly they you know, probably some of them do. Well, in doing some reading about these types of fungi, I know there are some that can develop the ability to hunt nematodes if need be, or some that mm -hmm. can develop that saprobic function if, if they need to. Morels are this enigmatic mushroom, so it makes sense to me that they have some adaptability there. Uh, but I'm really fascinated to hear you've done that research on mycorrhizal, and that mycorrhizal aspect is firmly part of just shifting back a little bit to the secondary metabolites. Let's get into so secondary little, metabolites with mushrooms. So those are a bit different because most of the time, the secondary metabolites are only in the fruiting body. So psilocybin is an exception, which in, it's in, we know it's in the mycelium, but for example, in the death angel, there is not any of the amatoxins in the mycelium. And so what's really happening most of the time is that uh, the fungus is growing underground, it's metabolizing, and has waste products. And like us, they have to get rid of their waste products. But unlike us, they can't dump their waste products outside of their body because that's where they're going to eat next. Right. Right. So they can't dump them right out there. And so they hold them usually in the old part of the mycelium until the fruiting body is ready to be produced. And then it shunts all of its waste products up to the mushroom. And some of those happen to taste good to us. And some of them are toxic. Most of them are pretty benign. They don't make a difference either way, but there are waste products in every mushroom. That's a secondary use of the for the mushroom, and of course, the primary use is to produce spores. Right, and it would make sense, like you're saying, that those waste products from that primary metabolic growth process would get pushed up and up and up, and gradually become the building blocks for for some of these secondary metabolites. So, when you're eating the mushroom, you're eating the fungal toilet. Oh, that's just a lovely image. When we're eating the <laughs> fruit body, we're eating the waste dump of, of our fungi besides, you know, antibiotics, potential entheogenic substances and mycotoxins. Are there any other noteworthy secondary metabolites that, that we should know about? So most of the things that people are making tea of and chaga and ganoderma and things like that are not secondary metabolites. Those are beta glucans and other large sugar molecules that seem to be what's effective. And so that's kind of a different total system. That's part of the, the an integral part of the fungus, you know, parts of the cell walls and things like that. And so that's not secondary, that's not secondary metabolism at all. You know, there are certainly a lot of these kinds of mushrooms that people are using. I think we still need more double blind studies on them for more uh, reliability. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence, but anecdotal evidence is not double blind studies, which is my standard. You're referencing the medicinal mushrooms that are exploding into our cultural consciousness and food industry right. and everything right now. Because, you know, I'm someone who's talked with a lot of people who grow medicinal mushrooms and produce medicinal mushroom products. I myself love the idea of using these naturally synthesized medicines, as it were. We're going to leave out our 
potentially up in the air definition of natural. You've made me rethink here. But these potentially natural substances the mushrooms are creating is kind of our own fungal pharmacy. But I have had some folks in the past also tell me that the connections aren't quite as clear as we want them to be, because like I said, we all want to think nature's pharmacy is out there in mushrooms. So there, there are some studies being done, but there are, a lot of these clinical trials are really small, with small numbers, and they're not necessarily double blind. You know, double blind, of course, is when the, neither the patient nor the doctor knows what the treatment is, whether it's the treatment or the placebo. You know, that's something that, that we want for all our medications, all our food. We want a double blind. So you would think we would at least have that level of standard, maybe not quite as dire a double blind study as that, but you think we'd, we'd, yeah, yeah. It, we'd require that same standard when we're going to call something medicinal. Uh, so that's another interesting angle. And I, again, I've heard that feedback before, even the feedback that these are epidemiological studies <laughs> that are not as exacting and can have a lot of uh, subjective data that kind of leaks in there as well. And I want to mention that there are pretty prestigious places that are looking at medicinal mushrooms. There's a, a group of people at the Mayo Clinic, for example, one of Johns Hopkins, two of the best hospitals in the country where some of this research is being done, but I haven't seen much come out of it yet. I know they were working on it. I met a woman from Mayo, gosh, 20 years ago now. No, not that long, 15. She came to the International Medicinal Mushroom Conference where I was, and so, you know, they're looking at it. Outside of just the academic world, outside of the research that you do, what do fungi represent to you? What do mushrooms represent to you? Is there any spiritual significance? Is there any idea that you're interfacing with this organism that's greater than yourself? Does any of that come up for, for Tom Bolt? Because you seem very grounded, but I'm wondering if there's a little <laughs> woo-woo in there. I've always loved nature, even as a kid. And so, you know, finding fungi as something I like to do and study, there's something new every day and there's something... There's a wow thing every day. The evolution of it is really interesting. Whether there's a spiritual connection, I don't I don't have an answer to that. I don't know. You don't have an altar adorned with crystals with mushroom statues on it or anything in your home? I actually do. Here's my cabinet of mushroom paraphernalia. You do literally have an altar full of amazing mushroom <laughs> sculptures. Mushroom paraphernalia. Oh, I see shungite pyramids or orgone pyramids in there and crystals and okay. That one is my prize right there, which is the nativity scene inside evolution mimic mushroom. <laughs> That's fantastic. Where are some of the amazing places you've traveled and studied fungi? Uh, it's been mostly in this country. So I've been, I've lectured in 38 states, uh, mushroom hunted in most of those at the same time. So of course. Uh, so that's fun. I took a trip to Malaysia to go to a mushroom festival. I uh, went to Slovenia for the International Medicinal Mushroom Conference. That was fun. Germany. Those are some cultures with some deep mycophilic roots. Yeah. You know, in, in America, we're mostly mycophobic. People are afraid of mushrooms. Supposedly we get that from the British. But I think that's opening up now. It's way you know, there's lots of young people that are involved in, in fungi now. And, you know, when I go to mushroom forays, there's more young people than there used to be. So that's very heartening for me. I always say that I'm a symptom of that current <laughs> mycological wave is, yeah, you know, yeah. so many people are, are discovering fungi and all these amazing properties we've hinted at here and their, their role in the ecosystem. And it probably goes along with Western science catching up to seeing how present fungi are in all of these different ecological roles. As more knowledge and groundbreaking discoveries are made, of course, more and more people get interested in it. Talk fungi were it. largely ignored for most of science. It's only been the past 50 years that fungi has even had its own kingdom. Actually, 1980. Okay, and for some reason I had 1969 stuck in my head. Is, is mm -hmm. 1980 the creation of kingdom fungi? Many people were studying it before they had their own kingdom, but mostly in botany departments and plant pathology. We have the first major in, in the country that's tagged with, uh, you can get a degree 
uh, in biology with a concentration in plant and fungal biology. So as far as I know, no one else in the country has anything tagged with fungi. Are there other ways that mycology is showing up in the academic sphere? Are there more and more degree programs, more people starting to offer courses uh, in mycology? There are more people working on fungi who are not necessarily mycologists. So they might be using fungus as a tool to get answer genetic problem. Certainly there's been an explosion in medicinal medically important fungi. So fungi that infect people, lots of people working on those as, as people become more immune suppressed and there are more fungal infections. We've been talking about some things about fungi that are not the things that necessarily inspire us, make us go ooh and awe, ah, but fungi do also have a role as pathogen. I mean, you talk about rusts and smuts. They're a very creative force. When you think of mycorrhizae, they're very life-giving and key to letting other things thrive. But there's also a side of them that is uh, murderous, if you will, <laughs> that there is, a dark is destructive. Side of mycology. That might be the name for this interview, the dark side of mycology. And you have the you know, Dutch elm disease has killed off the elm trees and chestnut blight has killed off those and white pine blister rust. And, you know, a lot of these introduced pathogens that came from other countries that have wiped out North American plants, especially trees that are more obvious. Like anything, there's, there's light and dark when it comes to, when it comes to fungi. How much is left undiscovered when it comes to this world of secondary metabolites, how much is still undiscovered, do you think? Because there are so many species of yeah, fungi. I think, I think most things have never been tested. Yeah. Every year there's more mycotoxins being discovered. And so there's probably lots of toxins that we're that we're eating. You know, of course the poison is always as always the poison is in the dose. If we're not getting the a huge dose of it, they're probably safe. You know, just like everything else. Right. And it also opens the door to there may be other antibiotic metabolites that we haven't discovered. There may be other psychedelic metabolites that, that we've never discovered. Yeah, I mean they found they found the the flying salt shaker death, uh, the cicada pathogen that produces psilocybin, psilocybin. Matt Casson at West Virginia. It's crazy. I've heard a little bit about that. Is this the, the process by which cicadas get infected? Eventually, you know, their rear falls off while they're undergoing these psychedelic yeah. effects, and then they try to mate with every other cicada around them? Yep, that's the one. I mean, mind-blowing. And to think that that was undiscovered, I mean, such a, a vivid biotic process was still undiscovered up until recently, just makes you think how much is still out there that we haven't found yet just for lack of testing, just for lack of manpower, if you will. But, you know, there's not enough people working on mycology, even still. You yeah. know, we only know about 5%, even know about 5% of the species that are out there. There's a lot of potential for other kinds of chemicals and drugs and such. Do you see the primary upswell in the new mycophilia that's kind of on the rise? Do you see that primarily in amateur circles rather than academic or both? Certainly it's huge in amateur mycology. I think, you know, I've gotten a lot of my colleagues in my biology department interested in fungi. So I at least don't have to explain mycelium every time I say the word. They hear about it and, you know, I've collaborated with them on various things and, you know, and academic people are very interested. So, you know, there aren't many mycology positions that become available every year, but people are putting them into it. You know, they're calling themselves a geneticist when they're really a mycologist or they're calling themselves an ecologist and they're really, you know, a mycologist. And so, although the positions that call themselves mycology may be smaller, there are more mycologists in academia probably than ever. So as a discipline, it's leaching more and more into all these other natural science disciplines, probably. When you take beginning botany classes, they don't tell you about mycorrhizae. They don't tell you that there's, they show you these roots and they say, oh, there's a root cap and there's also, and there's not any of that stuff in the mycorrhizal root. Right, which how could you leave that out? It's so fundamental. So I think that's getting better. I gave a lecture at a botanical society meeting about, I called it the F word, what, what students need to know about fungi. 
<laughs> people crowded into the room for that lecture. So I was impressed that they were really interested in knowing more about that fungi. In my own family, I've seen that people who are already into the natural sciences tend to be the ones that gravitate most quickly to fungi. And I think that's what you're talking about being illustrated. My grandfather was a biochemist and my father is a biologist. And when I got interested into mushrooms as an amateur, they both immediately latched onto it, obviously with a even a higher level of understanding than I could hope to achieve. Uh, but they both acknowledged that this was something that was a huge neglected part of their training. And they said even at the time when they were doing their graduate work, basically back in the 60s, 70s, they knew that this was a huge undiscovered area of science that would have massive implications. That overlap didn't happen, uh, which it sounds like it's finally starting to happen now. Yeah, that's good. Makes me happy. The other thing that stood out to me, and this may be too big of a topic, I'm not sure what I'm getting into when I talk about fungi involved in coal formation, but as briefly as you can, just tell us a little bit about what that means. I mean, what are we talking about? How can fungi be involved in forming coal? So I got an email one day from some researchers in West Virginia who were looking at coal formation. So a you know, geology professor. And so uh, he sent me some pictures and it, he had some, what he, it looked like fungi growing in the resinite of the coal, which is the, uh, the resin part from the tree. And so uh, we looked at that and discovered it was probably a cladosporium, but it looked like a modern cladosporium. So we started looking at other fungi in the coal, in different coals, and there were lots of spores in there. And so there are several hypotheses about how coal was formed, and they were pushing this fungal, the fungi had something to do with it. Other people say that it, it was just pressure or burning other things like that. And so they were sort of experimenting with trying to make coal with these methods. And so it's kind of interesting. And so, you know, I have three papers in the International Journal of Coal Geology about fungi. So it's kind of cool. Sometimes you just luck out and you find something interesting or someone sends you an email. You go with it. And it's really interesting to think that fungi could be responsible for even geologic processes. I know here in Northern <clears throat> California, there have been uh, professors at UC Berkeley and places discovering fungi's role in helping areas recover from wildfires and helping the ground open up and that kind of thing. So it's interesting to think that fungi could even be on that level of, of geologic processes. Now, was uh, there any outcome from that study or did you guys publish the paper and the jury's still out? Uh, the jury's still out. There's still it's a lot of work. It's hard to prove anything that big. Science is about arguing, figure out which hypothesis is right. And you might argue with, well, you can argue with the hypotheses. I like to think that mushrooms are responsible for forming all the coal. So until someone tells me otherwise, I might have to go with that one. There was a hypothesis at one time that said that coal was formed because the fungi had not yet developed enzymes to break down lignin. But that has since been disproven. Okay, so they couldn't break down wood. How would that mean they would form coal? Because the trees didn't degrade once I they, see what you're saying. they died. And so those trees were available or whatever else happened. Well, and it would seem significant that you said it's modern cladosporium. I guess the differentiator there would be, you know, are you finding prehistoric fungi on these uh, or prehistoric mycelia on these pieces of coal? Or is it something more more modern? That's what we wondered about, whether... The resonite had formed around the cladosporium where the cladosporium had grown through the resonite. We don't know the answer to that. Fascinating to think about all the different things we're going to be researching. <laughs> Is there any current research you have going on that we should know about that we haven't covered? I've been peppering little pieces here and there because I want to try to cover everything. But is there any other really important work that you want to tell us about now? One of my students is finishing a 20-year survey of fungi here in the Driftless area. So we uh, the Driftless area is a, was unglaciated 10,000 years ago, unlike most of the Midwest. So there should be relic species here. And so we've got about, you know, and in 20 years, we've collected about 1,200 species. 
and the three areas we've concentrated on have very little overlap, like 20%. Wow. So Sabrina is taking that data and we're, then we're going to sequence everything, figure out whether they're something that is the same as what's outside the driftless area or whether it's the driftless area has some unique species. And we already know that some things are more common here than other places. And we have some evidence, some preliminary evidence that says that some of these things are different. That's fascinating. And I'm sure it's too early to form a hypothesis of how glaciation would affect uh, fungi and right. uh, fungal species. For example, we have uh, Boletus frostii, which is that red, red bullied with the- with the, uh, Oh, beautiful uh, mushroom. Really obvious uh, fungus. We have it here in the next closest distribution is somewhere in Appalachia. So do we have an Appalachian relict here is the question. You know, there are already details about this, something called the Pleistocene snail that's endemic here and uh, some other kinds of plants and things like that that are only found here. It's interesting, the questions of biogeography that come up and evolutionary biology that come up when you start looking at fungi for this kind of research is what kind of assumptions can you make about, you know, different epochs or what assumptions can you make about how things traveled or what areas might have been closer together at one time or more related than we think. It brings up all these uh, amazing questions just through this species examination and, and data gathering. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, distribution is mostly a mystery to me. But there's websites like uh, Mushroom Observer and iNaturalist that are kind of helping with these distributions now where you know, the amateur people kind of figure out distributions of them. It's really interesting. Yeah, and it gets more of that manpower we were talking about on the job to put some of these data points together. I've had a lot of guests tell me that. I think, those... women, I think women help too. Women power and manpower. Thank you. And I actually had one of my guests tell me, you know, we, we need to start calling it queendom fungi. We don't know that it's a kingdom. Well, you've been really generous with your time and covering me jumping around between all these topics, but I do want to wrap up with some final thoughts that give us even more insight into who Tom Volk is as a person. I mean, I can already tell that you're fun, you're informative. Uh, there's a lot of great things we can infer about Professor Volk, but just to get a little deeper here, can you tell us a mushroom that you love? Like I said, deep, insightful stuff here. A mushroom you love and why, and why we should know about it. And this doesn't have to be a favorite or anything, just a mushroom you love that, that you think we should know about. Um, I like chanterelles. I think they're delicious and interesting. And, you know, what we used to think was one species in North America probably is 40 species. It's uh, an interesting, leads the question of what is a species. So that's a whole nother podcast. That is a whole nother podcast. Species may not be as defined a category as we think it is. Like most things we're discovering in these areas of life sciences, things aren't as static as we want them to be. Right. We, as, we sometimes assume that evolution is done, but it's not. We're in the middle of it. <laughs> That's a great point. It's not over. Evolution's still happening right now. And then another question here. What advice would you give to an 18-year-old Tom? I don't know. I think everything worked out okay, but I think I would be more, it could have been more directed about what I was going to study, but it, I think it, everything worked out fine. You know, I did mycology and it's worked out for me and I met a lot of really interesting people. I would say keep going. Keep following your path you're on and it's going to work out I mean, great. I mean, it's all sort of random. I think life is random. I absolutely do not believe things happen for a reason but I believe that things happen and you take advantage of them or you don't, you know, that's a bigger deal to me than, than any of that. My heart transplant, which was 14 years ago this week is, you know, changed everything for me as well. So you know, I'm a more open person. I, I'm caring more and I'm not as uptight as I once was and think I'm a better person after my transplant. Yeah, I mean, talk about a life-changing experience, literally, having yeah. having a new heart. Again, something that's probably for another podcast or two, talking about <laughs> that journey and that, and that life experience. And then a pretty big, broad question, but what is the lasting impact 
that you hope to make with your work uh, in mycology? What is the lasting impact you hope to have? You know, I think as long as somebody remembers you, you never die. And so I hope that people will remember me, you know, as someone who was a teacher and taught a lot of students, had 23 master's students. And I think the teaching is my legacy. It would be almost impossible for people to forget you with the prodigious amount of work you put out and the amount of students that you've helped on their way. You know, that kind of effect does grant you a sort of immortality, I think. And speaking of that work, that prodigious volumes and things you've written, uh, where can people find more information about you, uh, websites? Where can we go to find more of your work? Most of it is on my webpage, tomvolkfungi.net. I haven't had access to it for about 10 years. And so it hasn't been updated for a while. So that might be a project for this summer when I don't have anything else to do. <laughs> but we'll see. It depends on how ambitious I get. You can find me on the Facebook and I, I have a Twitter account that I hardly ever use. Probably the reason why you seem balanced and sane is you aren't on Twitter. So probably a good <laughs> idea. Well, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time with us today and walking, walking the audience through, but also walking me through some topics that I just didn't know much about that are so central to especially humans relationship with fungi and maybe uncovering some uncomfortable truths that we need to that we need to wrestle with here but thank you so much for coming on the show glad to be here thank you very much